Hi, good afternoon from sunny Glasgow, Scotland, uh, where we are hosting the fourth Aquanau audience uh, with, the, um, with, with the kind hospitality of the University of Strathclyde. As many of you know, the Aquanau audiences are designed to uh, spread the word about water, uh, to educate um, society um, about uh, water as a global strategic resource, uh, to engage cross-silo discussion across water technology, water policy, water governance, transnational water issues, and uh, to also, with the help of our um, supporters, the Scottish Government, Highlands and Islands Enterprise and Scottish Enterprise uh, give a platform for Scottish uh, excellent water technology. We have uh, a, a wonderful panel today again, and um, I'd like to introduce each of them, but it's better if they introduce themselves. Um, so a, a couple of minutes each. We have um, initially uh, one um, remote panelist who is John Oldfield from Wash Advocates. Uh, can, can we have a couple of minutes to uh, explain yourself, John? You bet. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. And uh, David, thanks so much for, uh, for giving me an opportunity. I sure wish I could be there uh, in person with you and, and the rest of the panel. And greetings from, uh, I think, equally sunny Washington, D.C. So in, in, in two minutes, uh, Wash Advocates, the group which I lead here in Washington, is a nonprofit advocacy, lobbying, and fundraising group dedicated entirely to the global WASH challenge. Uh, WASH being an acronym for Water, Sanitation, and Hygiene. Uh, our job is uh, really to create and to strengthen political will for WASH, Water, Sanitation, and Hygiene, across the globe. Uh, certainly, we have a particular focus on Washington, D.C., but we're also interested in actively working with uh, other donor countries uh, and our partners throughout Africa, Asia, and Latin America. Uh, at its simplest, our job at WASH Advocates is to, uh, to increase the amount and the effectiveness of grant making and programming in the global WASH sector, to increase both the top line quantity of grant making and programming uh, and, and the bottom line quality, the sustainability uh, of those programs. So my personal background is in, uh, I spent uh, several years in the 90s uh, doing democracy and governance work for the US government, uh, primarily in Africa and Eastern Europe. Uh, I went into the private sector, economic research and private equity for the next few years. And for the last eight years, I've been involved in the WASH space and the water and sanitation space to uh, focusing primarily on advocacy, again, on creating and strengthening political will for this issue across the globe. Uh, I, I believe, my colleagues and I believe strongly that the way to solve the global WASH challenge at scale, at 100%, is to focus on creating and strengthening that political will. And I'll say this, as, as difficult as it is to work with political leaders, with politicians, and first and foremost would be those in Washington, D.C. these days. Working with public officials is our primary focus at WASH Advocates, simply because we believe it's, it's under-recognized, it's under-capitalized as an approach to solving development challenges, and it uh, provides a clear, uh, if not simple, path to universal coverage of water and sanitation. So thank you. That's great, um, John. And, and, and you're going to get more time to talk because uh, it, it, it is um, a passion of the Aquino audiences um, to, to address the WASH challenge. Our host here is the University of Strathclyde, and we're um, very grateful that um, Professor Kalen is uh, with us on the panel. And perhaps you'd take a, a few minutes to introduce yourself, Bob. Thank you very much. Well, first of all, I'd like to thank all of those who are watching um, for coming in and, and, and listening to us today. Um, the University of Strathclyde um, was founded in the Enlightenment and is a place of useful learning. And so much of what we see in the challenges for water, sanitation, hygiene, and, and other integrated water resource management issues are really practical, useful implementations that still have to be moved forward. 
So I'd like to thank you all on behalf of uh, the university for being here. And also um, with my other hat as a member of the Hydro Nation uh, Forum uh, for the Government of Scotland um, that I welcome you all on behalf of the Scottish Government. Um, my personal background is um, also from um, the United States. I, I started my studies in the University of Arizona in sunny Tucson, Arizona, um, and be became a pa passionate about uh, uh, water resource issues in arid and semi-arid environments uh, over 25, 30 years ago. And it's through that I had the opportunity to work with, throughout the world uh, th with UN agencies, um, NGOs, and others on uh, water resource management issues, um, looking at chemistry, water quality, uh, resource management, and in particular fossil waters uh, throughout the entire globe because we, we realize that a lot of the water that we're using, um, what hasn't gone into the ground recently has actually gone into the ground thousands or tens of thousands of years ago. And so when we start trying to understand how to manage water resources, we have to understand um, the movement of these waters over long time periods. Um, I'm also very fortunate to currently be working a lot in uh, Africa, um, working with some really fantastic uh, different groups uh, throughout um, the Southern Africa, in particular in Malawi. And uh, for that, hopefully we'll be able to share some of our experiences, our recent experiences with that with you later. Um, for now, I pass back over to our chair. And, 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 and thank you, Bob. And um, Kate has, has traveled a long way to be with us um, today and, and, and will also be attending the World Water Congress of the International Water Resources Association in Edinburgh, uh, Scotland next week. Um, uh, Kate uh, Harawa, can you please introduce yourself? Thank you, David. I am Kate Harawa. I am the country director for Water for People in Malawi. Uh, Water for People is an international non government organization. Our headquarters is in Denver and Colorado, United States. Um, our vision is a world where all people have access to safe water and sanitation, a world where nobody dies or suffers from waterborne and water related diseases. So we solely exist to make sure that everybody have access to safe water. And uh, we're working in um, 10 countries, and Malawi is one of those countries. Um, as uh, Water for People, we believe that water is a basic right for every person. So nobody should be denied this the access to safe water. And we have a strategy that we are implementing now, which we call Everyone Forever. So the everyone part is where we say everybody, and meaning everyone, should have access to safe water. The forever part is the sustainability part of it. So we would want to make sure that everybody has access to safe water and sanitation forever. Uh, and I'm so happy to be here today that I can be part of this panel to talk about issues of water because without water there is no life. Thank you very much. Thank you, Kate. Um, D Douglas McKenzie, uh, from, from closer to home, um, you, you uh, please introduce yourself. Okay, I'm the uh, chief executive of a company called Xanthella. Hopefully we're a profit-making uh, company. Uh, and we're there to uh, design and manufacture photobioreactors uh, for growing algae. Uh, my own background was as uh, an academic uh, uh, marine biologist based up at SAMS and Oban on, on the west coast of Scotland. Well, explain SAMS. Yep, uh, Scottish Association for Marine Science. It's one of the oldest uh, marine institutes in, in the world um, and it was, was basically grew out of things like the Challenger expedition. Uh, and I was uh, their first research fellow there, not at the very beginning, back in the 19th century, but in uh, 1989 uh, when I, I, I moved there. And it's the largest marine institute uh, in Scotland. And uh, so I set up and ran a marine biotechnology group there. And I then left in 99 for my first company, Integrin, which got involved in, uh, amongst other things, uh, uh, shellfish hygiene, which is very tied into water quality issues in, in the marine environment. 
and then I exited that company in eight, uh, nine, sorry, 2008, and then 2009 I formed Xanthella, mm -hmm. um, which again, it might seem a bit left field, but actually people are becoming increasingly interested in the use of algae, uh, not just to remediate uh, water and make it safe, but also to utilize what are considered waste nutrients and then turn them into valuable uh, products so that uh, particularly local communities can uh, make an income back uh, from the, the waste nutrients. Great. And, and um, our, our, our other panellist is uh, Ruby Moynihan, um, a, a Scotland Hydronation Scholar. Uh, please introduce yourself, Ruby. Yeah, so hi, my name is Ruby and I'm doing my PhD here in Scotland at the University of Edinburgh School of Law. Um, and that PhD is about international water law and trying to create mo more coherence between international environmental law on biodiversity protection and in fresh water. Um, I do that PhD as a part of a collaboration with a scientific research institute also in Germany called the Helmholtz Centre for Environmental Research and that's a very large um, research institute with over a thousand scientists looking at integrated environmental research. My PhD feeds into a project on water scarcity in, in that institute. Um, and I also work on um, a variety of different research projects in, in Scotland and abroad with a big focus on transboundary water governance and the laws around sharing transboundary water resources and ecosystem protection. And, and the, um, the, the Hydronation um, Scholarship is a Scottish Government initiative. Perhaps you could give us a, a couple of minutes background on that. Yes, yeah, so I'm a, one of the first cohort of Hydronation Scholars. Um, there are seven of us so, so far and another, um, I think it's seven coming in in, in next year. Um, and we are part of the Scottish Government's Hydronation Program, which seeks to, in my case, um, promote and support research on transboundary water governance issues. Um, that's, that's my remit under the program. And the programme itself um, aims to connect us with um, academia, but also more broadly across the science policy community and making sure that our research remains, um, has an impact beyond just university research. And, and, and it's uh, one of a number of initiatives of Sc Scotland's um, positioning as the Hydro Nation, um, and another of which is um, its um, attraction of the World Water Congress, um, which is happening in Edinburgh, um, Scotland, just 40 miles from here, uh, next week. And um, USCA News will be transmitting several um, uh, uh, live occasions from that, uh, which can be tuned into at uskanews.com. Um, we don't have hard themes for these Aquanow audiences um, because they're deliberately aimed to be middle brow rather than high academia um, or, or high science or high policy. Um, we are preachers, um, preachers for water awareness. Um, the, 20 years ago there was no climate awareness now there's climate awareness. We think that we can help to make water awareness uh, happen um, in, in the next few years. And that's why you're not sitting here watching us on a screen talking about um, desalination or, 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 or something esoteric. Uh, we are sharing views from across the different water silos, water technology, water finance, water um, governance. Um, and we think that a way to um, elucidate views is to look at what is hitting the news currently in water. Um, the answer is not enough. Now, I, I can say that because I'm the publisher of Uska News um, and, and we just publish news about water. But why is water not on the front page of the New York Times or the, the Glasgow Herald? Um, we have identified a number of stories that are on your screens at the moment um, which we think are interesting and we would like to um, eluc elucidate um, views about. Um, and the first one, if you click on your link, is, uh, has a headline which is UN official warns that Haiti cholera outbreak is falling off the international radar. 
Um, I, I, John, I, I hope you're still able to hear us and are, um, are, are still with us on all of this. Yes, loud and clear. I think you should go first on this to, to, to give us the WASH perspective. Well, okay, well, uh, first of all, Dave and Anuska News, thank you uh, for covering, for continuing to cover uh, the cholera situation in Haiti. Um, I thought it was an interesting article, uh, and, and you're right, it belongs uh, above the fold in uh, every online and offline uh, newspaper, magazine, etc., but uh, for the most part, it's not. I'll make this quick point about cholera in Haiti or cholera anywhere else in the world. Mm. This is preventable. Mm. Cholera occurs naturally, but the transmission of cholera from human to human and then the associated morbidity and the mortality, massive mortality rates in Haiti in particular from cholera is preventable. So what's interesting, uh, we try to let never let a good crisis go to waste uh, at WASH Advocates. And what we're trying to do above and beyond these morbidity and mortality statistics that we're all, uh, we're all uh, continuing to learn about, we're trying to do this right. We're trying to not simply raise awareness of the gravity of the cholera problem in Haiti and elsewhere, but what we're trying to do is raise awareness of its preventability, of its, of its solution, and use safe drinking water, sanitation, and simple things like washing one's hands with soap to get ahead of the next cholera outbreak, maybe to prevent the next cholera outbreak. Now, the soundbite is this. The Dalai Lama himself said, water is medicine. And I, I take that a little bit further. I say toilets are medicine. I say hand washing with soap is medicine, the best kind of medicine that prevents the transmission of cholera and other water, waterborne diarrheal diseases in the first place. And let me, let me push back just a quick second on your, your uh, remark that it's really falling off the radar. You know, for the most part, that's, that, that's true, but it's not entirely true. Uh, the, I'd, I'd highlight the work of the Pan American Health Organization and the Coalition to Eliminate the Transmission of Cholera in Hispaniola, Haiti and the Dominican Republic. I would highlight the World Health Organization's work with UNICEF and the Veolia Environment Foundation on the Global Task Force for Cholera Control. Uh, I'm trying to change the name of the Global Task Force on Cholera Control to the Global Task Force on Cholera Control and Prevention because that particular task force very much understands the, the importance of WASH in getting ahead of cholera and Ebola transmission. Um, it's also not entirely true that this is falling off the radar uh, even here in Washington, D.C. Uh, the U.S. Congress, uh, the House Foreign Affairs Committee in particular, is considering legislation focused on strengthening health systems uh, with a particular focus on Ebola in West Africa right now, but the U.S. Congress is focused not just on hospitals and health facilities and, and doctors and paraprofessionals, but it's focused on, the U.S. Congress is also focused on water and sanitation as part of those health systems. So um, I, I'd, I'd like to think that the story isn't going to, uh, to die. Um, now we saw Ebola pop up, uh, from which we can learn a lot of the same lessons as well. Thank you. John, but I mean, yeah, yeah, Ebola can make the front page because, like, you know, people, when it when it when it uh, it bleeds, it leads. But um, y water doesn't make the front page, and cholera doesn't make the front page. And, and, and I read the Washington Post every day. It doesn't. I I I think you're right, David, and I think that you're in a position about that. But uh, thank you for your efforts. Um, we we do reach out to the media. Uh, it, the media doesn't need our help in talking about the gravity of the cholera problem or of the Ebola problem. I think the media needs our help in, in the help of water experts, the help of wash experts, the help of health experts in talking not about the gravity of the problem, but about the solutions to the problem, many of which we under, are, are focused on, on treatment uh, and, and, and putting band-aids on these problems. but more media outreach uh, could be done by, I think, many people uh, uh, in your audience today focused on how these problems are actually being solved and hopefully prevented the next time around. 
Thank you. Um, yeah, yeah, I'd like you to um, to, to con contribute on this uh, on this one, Kate. Yeah. Um, thank you so much, David. It's indeed pathetic that even today we are still talking of cholera in Haiti, but not just in Haiti, in many other African countries, uh, including Malawi. But it's preventable. It's something that if people can join hands, governments, the UN organizations, NGOs, and focus and invest in water and sanitation, this can be prevented. But I believe we are not doing enough from all angles. Governments, uh, NGOs, we haven't talked enough about water and sanitation. Uh, I'll just give an example. We are talking of Haiti, yes, but we just had floods in Malawi uh, in January this year. And one of the impact of those floods was that uh, our water system was blocked for a number of about 15 districts were affected and cholera outbreak uh, flared up within that period. Uh, it's something that if we could have done, pre prepared properly, we couldn't have had cholera both in terms of investing in, in our water resources, looking at how we manage our water resources, how we, we invest in water resources, and even just public awareness on, just as John has said, about washing hands with soap. We could have prevented a lot. But now we are spending a lot of money buying medicine, looking after the sick, People, some people are not going to work because maybe they are looking after someone who is sick or ch children are not going to school because maybe somebody is sick or they are sick or their parents are sick. So it's high time that we really need to join hands and fight waterborne diseases, invest in water, make water the big issue and everybody should inv invest enough in water and sanitation. Thank you, Kate. Um, Bob, you you have a Malawi connection too. Yeah. In fact, other places in the world where cholera is broken out and there's other water resource issues. Um, one of the things I've really been interested in is trying to find a way to break down these silos or these barriers that you were talking about before. Um, when we look at, we hear of water, we hear of sanitation, we hear of hygiene, we hear of uh, food security and climate change adaptation and all these things. Um, and we start talking about sustainable development goals moving on from Millennium Development Goals and everybody says, well, how do we make it sustainable? And the only way to really do that is somehow start linking all of that together in the way we're, we're doing things. Um, and one of the things we started looking at in Africa, and we've seen other places in the world as well, is the infrastructure that have gone in for, say, water has been put in under one view under the MGD. Learning development right, goals. Right. You have sanitation under another one, which then falls under different ministries or different responsibilities. And NGOs might be a sanitation NGO or a water NGO. And so there's oftentimes not a connection that happens. So when you go out and people are saying, well, we have to have um, community led total sanitation, we need to have pit latrines for everyone, um, every family, um, we, we want to have open defecation free status, which is fantastic. Um, you, people don't think about, well, where are they in relationship to the water points that have been put in? Or maybe a water point has come in and they haven't thought about this. And the more we started looking and mapping out where all these things are, we started realizing that people aren't talking to each other on some simple things as much as, don't put it there because there's a toilet right next to it. And this, therefore, means there's a longer term potential risk. And therefore, we have to roll it back a little bit and think about, well, should we be thinking about how we put these in and should we provide simple tools. So, okay, okay, so joined up thinking. He's joined up thinking, exactly. Yeah, yeah. But that's, that's what sustainability is, but it's not happening because it's not a simple thing. Uh, people, uh, because they're in these silos, they don't have simple mechanisms to join them up. And so I've pulled out the IWRM, the Integrated Water Resources Management name, because it, it, it's 70s and 80s, it was a really big thing, sort of fell off, and now it's starting to come back. 
that we should be does it actually mean anything it does if you actually start at local simple levels like this you can take water making sure it's not in, impacted by the local it industries. should mean something it should mean something yeah but you have to get people engaged in a vertical way yep. from the local environment all the way mm -hmm. to the national and then to the transnational the transboundary issues as well too and that's I, I think something that we need to start learning in the post 2015 agenda is that we need to engage in policy decision making from the the lowest local level all the way up to the national and transboundary nationals uh, so that we actually have a better understanding how these how these things are affected. I've seen more and more times where policies uh, associated with each one of these different areas are not joined up, and therefore, when somebody comes in, they don't know what to do. They just do what they think is best at the time. Good stuff. Um, I, I, I'm going to take us straight on to our next story. Okay. Um, and, and it's about China and India, and, and, and they're fighting about dams. Um, the headline is Indian Premier urged to take up issues of Chinese dams on, um, on, on the Brahmaputra. Now, my theory, Bob, is that um, if we scare people about water and say water is going to cause wars, then people will start paying attention. Um, and, and, and this is one of those ones that could lead in that direction. Um, but perhaps I could ask Ruby to go first on this because you're a... a transnational water lawyer. Ruby, what's your take on this particular story? And uh, viewers can click on the link on their screen to see the story we're talking about. Yeah, well, I found this uh, an interesting article because, and, and there are several points that stuck out to me. Um, one of the first ones is the article only mentions two of the riparian countries that are on the Brahmaputra, um, which is it's, it's typical that in many transboundary rivers, uh, a very siloed debate um, evolves around two main hydro or superpower nations on uh, on and along rivers, and and that kind of um, detracts from that broader picture that needs to be addressed. So, yeah, of course, uh, Bhutan and ba Bangladesh are also on the Brahmaputra, and Bangladesh, especially being the the lower riparian, will be affected by um, significant changes in flow that happen because of dam building in China. Um, and there is no agreement, this is, a, this is the lawyery hat here, there is no agreement between the four countries on the Brahmaputra on how they share or manage that water. Um, and of course that does not bode well for regional stability when there isn't a strong mechanism for cooperation between the four affected riparians. Um, to work out how they need to cooperate when they do, when each country decides they want to do things like building dams or or utilizing the water for something else. Um, another thing that stuck out to me in the article was that it mentions this uh, this agreement between uh, India and China over the sharing of hydrological data. Again, this is this is. Uh, Actually, I think the agreement looks at flood protection as well, but again, these are just single issue agreements. So there are so many agreements in transboundary rivers around the world that only address such a small part of what needs to be addressed when you want to sustain and be manage a water course. So you need to address a much broader range of issues uh, to make that agreement stand up against the test of time and conflict and water scarcity. Um, also, really, it's about, you know, India in this case has, has um, put for concerns that it might be affected as a downstream country um, and if we want to talk about law here without getting too technical um, you know China is under an obligation in international law to if, if they're going to create or do um, any major developments that might cause significant um, cause significant transboundary harm to the to downstream riparians, they are under an obligation to um, conduct an environmental impact assessment and communicate that information to the affected riparians mm -hmm. if, it's a, if there is a significant um, chance of risk there. So it doesn't look like that happened and um, that, that's also sadly the ca most often the case despite it being... Oh, so, okay, so there, are there going to be water wars? Um, I really dislike this this water wars because I think it's a um, terminology because I think it's a really dangerous type of language to use. I think there has always been conflict over water since the beginning of time, um, 
and uh, there are lots of things you can put in place uh, to try and resolve that conflict before a war would break out. Yeah. Cool, we can we can try and stop it, but one of the other stories that we're going to come to is the Islamic State, which is now bigger than Syria, um, being in control or close to control of um, dams that have um, significant um, reservoirs and water sources that have significant strategic value. Um, it's it's <coughs> something that should be considered. Absolutely. On the on the water issue, issue of China, I mean, if you look at the way China's behaving as a riparian in different transboundary river basins or that affect its um, fuller territory, it's actually moving more and more towards a cooperative engagement with its riparians rather than any kind of military. Mm -hmm. um, sure. so, so that is the behaviour that, that China's moving towards, is a soft cooperation. Um, and then on, on the article about the Islamic State and uh, on the Euphrates, um, again, that's not a war about water. So okay. that's, that's a, the ISIS war is about something much broader than sure. water. And I think it's really important to be clear about when a, when a conflict is about a water, water scarcity or whether it's a conflict where, you know, nations have, since the beginning of time, utilised water as a strategic resource to gain political control, or non-state actors in the case of the ICE, of ISIS. Um, and so I think we've got to be careful to, to be clear about whether something is a conflict over the water itself, or whether it's being used yep. as a strategic, um, you know, point of control. Yeah. Okay. Yep. Excellent. Yeah, I mean, I, I I'd like to hear you. So I was going to say that I, I thought the encouraging thing here was that China is making the right noises about cooperation. They're not saying it's our water. They recognise that it's, it's everybody's water and it has to be managed. And uh, I mean, and indeed, actually, I think that they mean that. I think that mm -hmm. they have their hearts in the right places. I think it's when you become in danger is when suddenly the water is squeezed and suddenly there's conflicting interests. But here at the moment they're trying to manage the problem, as you say, before it becomes a problem. <coughs> that, that is very encouraging. And it may be my own ignorance, but it, it did uh, strike me as that for dealing with things like this, you really want a, a third party who can arbitrate once, the, mm -hmm. one, once some sort of conflict comes up. And I don't know if there is a body that has that role at the moment beyond the UN generally. And, and your company, is, uh, you, you, your technology is um, in internationally distributed. Yes, that's right. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And, and, and are you in Africa or China? Or where, where, where do you go? Tell us a little bit about yourself. Um, oh, okay. <laughs> uh, not yet. Um, basically, although we've uh, got reactors in Barbados at the moment, that was in fact our, our first place that they went to, and the interest in using technologies that algae um, is most obvious in, in island communities that tend to have very high fuel costs or they're very interested in eking out their, uh, their resources that they can. Africa is an obvious place to deploy it because of uh, really the infrastructural problems around, if we're talking biofuels, uh, the infrastructural problems around conventional oil in these areas. So the, the ability to make your own fuel locally uh, would be transformational in a lot of parts of, of rural Africa. Mm -hmm. uh, indeed, rural anywhere on the on the planet. Mm -hmm. um, so there is a lot of a lot of interest in those areas, and really, it's a matter of of getting the the, the capital and operating cost down low enough so that these technologies can be deployed. Um, but as actually the article later, India's uh, doing a lot of this mm -hmm. on the back of really quite low technology. So it, it, it is available for, for everybody. Really. Yeah. Bob, I was going to ask Kate a question first. Chris, and then I'll go. Mm -hmm. um, it, it, we, we use Can News um, report um, about the tensions um, around um, your lake in, in, in um, Malawi. Is that um, a fight about oil res or gas resources or about water resources? Um. I think it's it's both. Mm -hmm. um, water is a very very uh, treasure. It's a resource that everybody needs. So we have 
there is an issue between Lake Malawi, mm -hmm. between Malawi and uh, Tanzania. Um, <coughs> although the issue has only come out because now we want to start extracting oil from the lake. Right. So it may be both. Mm -hmm. But I think the, the major issue now is on the actual lake because the resources are in the lake. So to me, the, or the way I look at it, a water body or the lake as it is, it's a source of livelihood for many other people. So it's not just about the oil. There are fish. There's sure. uh, agriculture happening. So there is a lot that we use that water from Lake Malawi for apart from the oil coming in as an addition. So is water so the tipping point, or is it, or is it just a, 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 um, a Ruby's um, mm -hmm. um, explanation was very good, um, that, that, that it's, 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 it's kind of a side issue mm -hmm. um, on, 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 on everything else. Mm -hmm. um, should it be the main issue, or is it just you know, a, a sort of secondary consideration to other resource um, resources used by humanity? To me, I think water should be the main issue, and it must be the main issue. Mm -hmm. But because whatever other things that are coming in are coming in because there is water. Because there wouldn't right. be that oil in Lake Malawi without that water. Right. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. There wouldn't be fish in Lake Malawi without that water. There wouldn't be any agricultural activities without water. And if we go back backwards, uh, you will see that every civilization, early civilization that happened, happened around a certain body of water. And if there were tensions between countries, they were actually fighting because of that source of water. Yeah, absolutely. So I think we should go back and start valuing water or putting water at its value or the, the, the required level of value because it's a valuable resource. So people may go around it or may use it just as uh, maybe she said uh, for to, to gain even political gains from because of water. Because uh, I'll give an example even at local level when uh, politicians are campaigning or they want some power, they use water. Sure. They always maybe tell people, okay, we'll bring water to you or we'll do this. It's all related to water. So most of the time we put it aside as, okay, it's a side thing, but it's being used for many other bigger things. So why not lift it up to be where it belongs? And the people that are supposed to do that, uh, ask that uh, I'll, I'll use the word wash advocate, not specifically meaning wash advocate as an organization, but all of us as wash advocates, people that understand and know the value of water. Um, thank you. Um, Bob and then John, um, I'm, I'm going to um, come to you on that. And we're g I'm kind of combining two stories here because well, and, and, and I, I'm, I'm not the advocate, I'm just the moderator. But um, I, I think if we scare people about water, uh, then we can raise it on the agenda and get it to the front page of the Washington Post. And, um, and, and the ISIS um, having you know, the, the, the size of Syria and, um, and, and, and control of Euphrates dams is a major um, issue. And, um, and, and, and should be pushing water to the front page. Uh, so coming to you next on that, John, and just combine those stories, but um, first of all, Bob. Okay, well, I, I wanted to go back to this, the, the point you're making about wars and, and be a little bit sure. more controversial again. Please. Um, one of my students was uh, James Ferguson, who actually um, went and did some work in Sana in Yemen, and we started looking at um, some of the big conflicts that have occurred in the past and water actually is one of those things that could potentially cause problems and, and the, the lack of water. Um, and so we, when we started looking at this and he was starting to look at it more from his journalistic point of view, we started asking, well, what, where, where are these conflicts coming in? And, and as it was pointed out before, 
Um, biofuels, we need water and algae for biofuels. Um, we see a lot of deposits we need for the exploitation of shale gas and, and coal gas. We need to be looking at protection of water resources. And so m more and more, I think we should also be looking at the management as a nexus or a cross point between water and energy. Because these dams is, is much about the energy and the sustainability of our society with an energy resource, a hydroelectric energy resource, and the, then the, using the water for sustaining our agricultural needs, because that's where most of our water is actually used, is in the agricultural section. So, so we, we need to start thinking of these as pinch points, not only with just water, but again, going back to the joined up thinking, that there has to be a crossover, a nexus between water and energy in some of the decision making, and perhaps recognizing, um, as you pointed out, a, a wider need to connect things in. Um, I, I was fortunate to work for many years in Syria, um, and I've, I've actually been, um, worked in the groundwater resources out by Palmyra, which has just been overrun. Um, Palmyra actually had flowing wells in such, up to about 1944, um, when the util overutilization of groundwater resources for agriculture in the area um, drove down the water um, resources enough so that the wells um, and the springs and the infrastructure that had been going since before, um, you know, two or three hundred BC, actually dried up. And it was part of the fact that there was um, a, an upwell of groundwater in that area that allowed that area to actually be one of the crossroads in the silk uh, trade. And all of, um, you had the Arab Caliphate in uh, was 600, 700s that used that as, as, a, as a, an important crossroads as well. So, so these we can go back and look at history and see that history has actually also seen these types of um, areas to be important resources because of the water, um, if, if we want to talk about the, the, that Middle East region. So I, I would say you know, maybe wars being directly caused, but actually wars are over, over resources and, and control of resources, as, as you had pointed out. And I think water is one of those really important resources that will potentially cause conflicts into the future. And therefore, we need good instruments to make sure we come up with um, some kind of agreements uh, across nations and across organizations, whether it's between two uh, villages or two countries. Well, in, in instruments are, are, you know, c come along with um, political will, which is driven by societal will. Um, John Oldfield, um, you, you do an amazing job in raising um, uh, uh, political awareness about sanitation issues in, in, that, you know, in, in that little town of Washington, D.C. Um, but should, should we just be scaring people crapless in a way that we're not yet? Boy, uh, interestingly phrased question, David. Um, let, let me just reinforce a, a couple of things I'm hearing here. I, I think uh, Ruby brought it up first, and, and others have, have seconded it. Um, water is a threat magnifier. It's a threat multiplier. Those are the words used by our intelligence community here in the United States. You know, water hasn't itself caused a war, an interstate war, since 2500 B.C., but, but that has absolutely no probative value. You know, will water cause a war in the future? Um, I, 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 again, agree with Ruby that I, I don't like that language. What I prefer to focus on is the fact that since water is so fundamental to human existence, let's look less at ways to minimize the downside to mitigate the risks of water, and let's look at ways to maximize the upside of water. You know, Kate said it best. I mean, without water, there is no life. Water brings people together, preferably before conflicts arise. Uh, one of the, the board positions I hold is with the Institute of Multi-Track Diplomacy uh, here in the Washington, D.C. area. And so my call to action on this particular front would be uh, to the water professionals, the engineers in your audience, don't just mitigate risk, don't just minimize downside, but urge, uh, I urge water professionals to almost be diplomats, to, be, to, to take proactive, preemptive action when they can position water and sanitation as a solution, not just to mitigate conflicts, but to prevent them in the first place. Uh, the second thing uh, I'd add, you know, indirectly answering your question about it should we just be scaring people crapless, well, uh, there's a lot of scareware out there. I mean, one can, there's a lot of worst case scenarios about water, 
uh, I would direct people's attention to, to two documents. One is uh, the unclassified version of the, the U.S.'s uh, national intelligence estimate on global water security, which it's a bit U.S.-centric, as you might imagine. It says, water will continue to pose security threats to the United States and our allies. Secondly, the United States in both its public and private capacity is well positioned to help uh, developing countries with their water uh, challenges. And third, uh, this intelligence community report says that the United States is expected to solve, uh, to help solve these water challenges across the globe. So that document might be interesting to your audience. Uh, the second document would be that produced by the World Economic Forum uh, in Davos, uh, saying that water is, is one of the top three threats to global security over the next uh, next couple of decades. So th there's plenty of scareware out there. There's plenty of opportunities to learn more about the downsides. Uh, I think your audience is well positioned to focus on uh, the upsides. Yeah, but you and I both know that the classified pages, because uh, there's only about 19 pages that were unclassified, um, say that Karachi's gonna run out of water in the next five years and Yemen's a basket case and there are going to be wars. Well, uh, I, I certainly I hope there will not be, um, and I, I, I don't speak on behalf of any government, but I know that there are many efforts underway along the lines that, that Bob was just talking about, uh, it, it, combining WASH as a public health measure with uh, water as an, in, from an IWRM perspective, uh, from uh, water from an agricultural perspective, you know, in Yemen with the cultivation of cot, a highly water intensive crop, I think there's a lot of really, really smart people working on solving the water challenge in those two geographies in particular, uh, using any means at their disposal. Uh, right now, those, those means don't include kinetic security uh, means. Uh, could they? Yes. Uh, will they? Um, I hope not. I don't think they will. I think that the various stakeholders, public and private in those parts of the world, are going to find solutions to these challenges uh, before uh, at, at least interstate conflict breaks out. Thank, thanks, John. Let, let's be a little bit more optimistic. I, I'm really impressed with your um, technology, um, Douglas, and th thanks for sharing that um, with me. But I, I, I draw our, uh, our viewers' attention to um, the link that will be on, um, on your screen, um, which is related to your field. Uh, and, and the headline um, is, I, I, it's good to know that we're doing good stuff. Um, algae fed with wastewater show promise for biodiesel production. Um, and um, I, I, this is a, 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 a report coming out of Houston, but I know that we've reported, as is the news, um, another one coming out of Taiwan. It, it's a pretty hot sector. Um, it is, but, but I'm reminded uh, for basically as long as I, I've been involved in science and technology, the fusion scientists have been telling us that uh, fusion is, is 10 years away. And when you get to the 10 years, it's still 10 years. And uh, algal biofuels as a mass deployment technology at the moment is still looking like that. And it's taking the dent with the, uh, the fall, both the fall in uh, global oil prices for fossil oil prices and uh, also in, in the States, basically this revolution that fracking has produced, uh, which has meant that the Americans are much less worried about their uh, global strategic view of, of oil because they're, they're in a much better place. Um, so yeah, this, this is, is familiar uh, stories, but, uh, and people have been flying, Lufthansa had a big program where we're flying uh, civilian airliners on algal fuels. The Americans looked at this back in the 70s and concluded that there was no technological barriers to uh, basically having a lot of oil coming from, from algae, the downside was cost. And at the time, they, they reckoned they would have to, uh, oil prices would need to triple um, in, in real terms uh, before algae would become uh, competitive. So I, I wouldn't go running out and buying a lot of shares in algal oil companies yet. And indeed, what's happened in the States because uh, companies like Sapphire were very good at um, uh, going to the stock market, raising lots of money, which they're now sitting on, and they're finding it very difficult to 
to move to the sort of scales where uh, biofuels would start to impact. And what they've done instead is look at, well, what else could we use algae for? And uh, there, there's a, a variety of very high value compounds that you can make, uh, things like, like three omega fatty acids, uh, pigments like astaxanthin. So people are concentrating on these high end. And that's where it becomes more interesting because there it's really, uh, you know, it's a bottom line issue. And basically it's how cheaply can you make the compounds which will give you competitive advantage. And people are very interested in feedstocks that you can use. And can you get your feedstocks for free? Uh, what makes algae attractive is that uh, they require water, but actually uh, they don't need good water. They're, they're great right. grey water. In fact, they prefer grey water. Mm -hmm. They can do seawater as well. You can do any water. Um, as long, and we have a lot of seawater on, on the planet. But grey water is where it's interesting because they can extract uh, nutrients from them, they can extract nitrogen, they can extract uh, phosphorus. And that is one of the major costs, is actually your, your feedstocks uh, going into the algae. Um, and what we're particularly interested in is actually sweet spots where the feedstocks for algae are actually all locally available, uh, which you could then... So, because as soon as you hit a point where your scale of manufacture hits a point where you're having to import feedstocks, it all becomes very uneconomic at that point. But if you can extract your feedstocks locally, then you could... Uh, produce even potentially biofuels economically, locally, at scales that are meaningful to local scales. And that's actually where we see the deployment of the technology, particularly in areas like islands mm -hmm. uh, and, and remote rural communities, rather than uh, basically the American vision was to have, you know, uh, billion gallon algal refineries. And then when you start looking at the land use uh, that, that's actually necessary, and then you actually mm -hmm. start looking at water, it it, it literally becomes a pipe dream at that point. Interesting stuff. So maybe not as positive as you'd like. Maybe it's <laughs> not as positive. Um, uh, Bob, um, mm -hmm. you're an environmental scientist. Mm -hmm. um, what's the what's the upside here? Well, I mean, I mean, let's go back to this integration of water and sanitation we started with. Mm -hmm. um, one of the fortunate things I've been doing in Africa is working with local communities to try to find all the waste in their communities and turn them into positives. Mm -hmm. um, we just had some um, Scottish government and DFID people out to some of the, the um, rural communities we're working with. And we're not telling them what to do, we're asking them, how can you make this happen? And so they, the, of course, you, have, you put the, uh, a well in and they have to collect um, um, money to actually pay for the value of the resource of the water that's coming out which is used to maintain that water resource. But what they've then done is all the extra water from washing out your buckets, they've actually put in small scale um, agriculture to help with food security. And then they're selling some of this, um, the proceeds from that, to help maintain the water supply, but also provide social capital in case someone becomes ill, they can actually send them somewhere with, a, with, with an ambulance. And then they're trying to tie in the sanitation to this and saying, well, how can we actually gather some value back out of the, all these pit latrines that need to be emptied rather than just rebuilding them? And that's been one of the blocking points is how do we actually turn something like that mm -hmm. in sanitation from a negative, a social negative, into a social positive? And you have to have some kind of product that comes out of that. And algal ponds would be an ideal place where you can mix, use some of that gain the, net, the, the, um, the value back out of it from growing algae in one direction, have another economic positive for a, commu a small community or a group of communities, and then the residual of that plus mulching would actually be good fertilizers to go back into their agriculture. So you can see um, under there's the a integration, there's a cycle. There's a cycle. Yeah. But you have to have enough innovation in people that are willing to think instead of really high tech that appropriate technology endpoint an entry point that actually allows the economics to balance instead of making millions, making thousands might actually be a very useful community like that. What's, um, I, I, I'm asking you because I don't know, yeah. um, but I, I, I'm, I'm familiar with the fact that um, Scotland has um, some limited aid or development um, um, capital and that Malawi is, is um, a, a focus. 
Um, what's the uh, why Malawi? Well, um, actually, fortunately, <laughs> yeah, yeah. well, I'll, I'll start and I'll pass over to Kate. Yeah, please. Fortunately, from Strathclyde in Glasgow here, we have David Livingston, who's from Blantyre, Certainly, yeah. who actually studied in the precursor of Strathclyde at Anderson and Glasgow University, mm. who then went to that whole part of Africa and was, was a champion for many things out there. So there's, in the heart of the people in this part of the world, there's a, a link to that part of the world. And so it's almost like we're brothers and sisters ac across the equator. Um, Mary's Meals right now has over a million people around the world, um, that they f uh, children that they feed on a daily basis. So it's not just Scottish government. The people of, of Scotland and this part of the world have uh, very deep pockets and provide an awful lot of um, interaction and both and, and, and is, is, is that recognized? I mean, you know, I, 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 I mean, what, what's the difference between Scotland and Germany or like Netherlands or? The relationship that is there between Malawi and Scotland cannot be overemphasized. Mm -hmm. If you ask any Malawian, even a five-year-old boy, girl, mm -hmm. will tell you they know there's Blanta in Scotland, and they know Dr. David Livingstone was born in Blanta in Scotland. Mm -hmm. So there's that link that Malawians automatically associate themselves with Scotland. So we're not just, so, so I as a Scot, I'm not just being vain, you know, it, it is actually a no. genuine connection. If you just introduce yourself to say, right. I'm David, I'm from Scotland, people go, oh yeah. yeah. I'm also from <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so I'm also indirectly <laughs> from Blantyre. Um, <laughs> yeah, well, so, no, that's so interesting. Yeah, so as Bob said, uh, the upside of this, and I like it, it's like, from something that could have been useless or a waste or could have been mm -hmm. brought in negative impact, it's being turned to buy diesel or fertilizer, mm -hmm. which is very important. Mm -hmm. And similarly, using the climate justice fund from the Scottish government, we are able to implement the project that Bob was just talking about, where we are also using something that could have been just wasted. Mm -hmm. People are able to say, okay, they are not just drinking water from the borehole, but the water that is wasted through cleaning up of the buckets or other means, it's being used at the end of the, 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 the soccer way, mm -hmm. where they are able to grow crops and either sell or sell to themselves, mm -hmm. and uh, nu it means they are they are gaining more nutrients, or they are gaining more money. Mm -hmm. But this is water that, if you don't take care of it, at the end of it, it uh, it becomes stagnant, and it becomes a bleeding place for mosquitoes, mm -hmm. where sure. then mm -hmm. malaria is transmitted. Mm -hmm. So. It's like killing two birds with one stone. So yeah, you, you can answer, turn these, some these, negative. These answers seem to be obvious, yeah. um, but, um, but, but why, why, why aren't we all doing it? Why is the world not paying sufficient attention to water? Hmm. I think that's a big question. Maybe people don't understand yet the impact of Water oh, because because it's it's viewed as, and this is Ruby's. Mm -hmm. I completely respect Ruby's um, um, perspective that it is. It's not the tipping point. It's it's, it's secondary or tertiary. Um, I, I don't I don't think it's secondary at all. I just think it's really important to understand that that the that water scarcity alone. Um, not just scarcity. Or water issues alone, they do not exist alone. They're so sure. interconnected. And so to only address it as a water issue fails to understand what an interconnected medium it is. And it, on the issue of scarcity, and this was bringing back to the conflict that I was talking about, it's, it's, it's very rare that just water, water scarcity alone leads to a conflict. It's, it's water scarcity... As, as the stimulator in a situation that is already politically in, unstable, that has energy security issues. Well, okay, yeah, 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 yeah. Okay, but Ruby, I mean, yeah. okay, so we, we, would you, energy doesn't exist alone. Energy no. relates to everything, food exactly. relates to everything, water relates to everything. So I, mean, you, I, I don't think, um, 
well, I would challenge um, your uh, uh, um, position that water is just has to be viewed as one of those things. No, um, I think it's a very critical one. And I like, what was the word that John used? This sort of, I don't know, stimulator or... John, what did you say? Uh, I, I, maybe a magnifier or yeah. a right. word. Mm -hmm. So I f it's a very, very critical and central. But I think it exists al within other things. That's, that's all I'm saying. And when, when I'm looking at the ISIS conflict, I'm looking at the, I, the war, the ISIS war is about a lot more than water. Oh, sure. Yeah, that's my point. Well, yeah. I also want to David, if you're actually expressing a, a sort of a Western centric view there, <coughs> mm -hmm. and actually in lots of parts of the world, water is the number one issue for, mm -hmm. for people. Uh, I, I, I could time out in the, what were the Gilbert and Ellis Islands, and believe me, water was a major issue there and, and becoming more so for these lagoons. But in, in the West, you know, we take water for granted. We, mm -hmm. we expect when we turn the tap mm -hmm. on, water to come sure. out and we kick up a fuss when it, when it doesn't. Um, There's lots of it in Glasgow. Right? Yeah, but, but actually it was funny, but with the cholera one, uh, cholera seems like an exotic disease far away, but in the 19th century it was a major killer in Glasgow mm -hmm. and just around here there were people dropping literally like, like flies. And we conquered that not because of our, our biology, not because of immunisation, things like that, but because we put in a good Clean water, water yeah. system. And which we're still living off uh, today. Um, so I, I yeah, I, I think maybe water is a lot more important in other parts of the world and maybe higher up the priority than we give it. Mm -hmm. But we, we take it for granted and, and we do that at our peril. Um, because as Haiti demonstrated, it, if your public infrastructure goes down, then we're just as vulnerable as the people in Haiti. Mm -hmm. John Oldfield, would you like to chip in? Well, uh, yeah. Thank, th thank you, David. I mean, you're, you just ask an interesting question. You know, these these answers seem obvious. So why aren't we doing them? You know, wh why do we still have 800 million people drinking each other's lukewarm feces on a daily basis? You know, why do we have a billion people continuing to defecate in the open when it's 2015? I'd suggest two answers for that. Um, I'm inclined to start with a lack of political will, because I work in an advocacy organization right now, and implicit to that, there is a call to action to every single one of your listeners right now, uh, in, in the North, in the South, everywhere in between. Make sure that your political leaders know that water is an important issue for you. You don't have to ask Californians about how important water is right now. That didn't used to be the case. Uh, what was just said about cholera and the, the great stink in London or cholera in Scotland, cholera in the United States. When there are these emergencies and when there are clear cut answers, water and sanitation to solve those problems, then political leaders can move and they can move quickly and they can move most importantly at scale, 100 percent coverage of water infrastructure, of sanitation infrastructure and so on. But when we're dealing with silent emergencies, emergencies that don't get above the fold in the New York Times and the Wall Street Journal. It takes a concerted effort on behalf of private citizens, commercial enterprises, private philanthropists, uh, school kids all over the world to make sure their political leaders don't, uh, to make sure their political leaders have the opportunity not to lead on water issues, but to follow the political will that's been generated by their people. Now, the second answer is uh, more on the commercial side of things. There are a, a lot of very interesting pre-commercial technologies that have, that have already been discussed, both ways to, uh, to minimize the downside of untreated human waste, but also uh, ways to maximize the upside of human waste and gray, gray water, black water, et cetera. Uh, it, it, to the list of, of uh, efforts uh, to uh, maximize the upside of human waste, uh, I'd point your audience to uh, three or four different groups. One is, uh, is Sulab International, uh, just outside of uh, uh, New Delhi, that converts human waste into biogas and has been doing so, I would say, at a, at a less than entirely commercial scale for years. Uh, Sanergy is a really interesting shop doing exactly the same thing, different business model, different financial model, but the same concept uh, outside of Nairobi. 
And there is a, a purely commercial outfit uh, still trying to get to, uh, to scale uh, called Waste Enterprisers, uh, I think in parts of West Africa that we're tracking here. So, you know, why are we not doing these? Why does water and sanitation remain a pre-critical mass issue? I'd suggest the answers are, are both political and commercial in nature. Perhaps less yet, <laughs> uh, and, I, I mean, I, and I do come from this as a, as a media person and a journalist. Uh, I, I, I think that there, it needs to get above the fold in, in the New York Times, and, and, um, and, and, and it's going to get there, um, but I mean, it can be helped. Bob, you. Uh, John, John it, it, one of the things I'd be really interested in, 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 in getting your opinion on as well, it's not just a call to actually get um, people engaged, but I mean, one of the things we're finding is a lot of the infrastructure that's been going in is non-functional within short periods of time. Mm -hmm. Are people actually getting value for what we're putting in? So if we go to the donors, we go to those who are, we're giving the two pounds a month or something like that from a TV ad, are we actually getting value from that in the infrastructure? We're finding simple things that, because there's a tick box, tick box, we, we put a number in, Nobody actually goes back and find out, well, is this still working two years mm -hmm. later? Mm -hmm. And what we've been looking at, we find that they actually don't continue to work as long as they really should. The average length of a, of a borehole we have now in the parts of Malawi we're working in is a, between three and five years. Now, 25 years ago, that was between 15 and 25 years. And this is because there's been a push to meet certain deadlines or certain numbers um, without actually realizing the, the value of the knowledge to put these infrastructure in. And so I, I would say not only we are, should we be calling to, to the, as you're saying, but we should also be asking that what we're putting in as a society to help these things actually have sustainability built into it. And sometimes it's as simple as what we found in Malawi. They didn't have clay to seal up the boreholes because it was too expensive. So we went and actually got um, termite mounds broke up the termite mounds, and that was enough to seal up the boreholes to keep them from actually being contaminated. So, so I think there's, there's, some, there's, there's other things that we should be looking at this as well, and I would welcome your, your views on that. I, I've not, um, my, my, my email here has failed, um, I, so I'm not, I'm not picking up questions online, and I apologize to, um, to the viewership. Uh, but I um, would certainly um, open this opportunity to um, have questions from the floor here at the, at the University of Strathclyde. Hello, my name is Sheila O'Reilly and I work quite a lot in the field of water and sanitation. You've been talking about getting things onto the um, front page of the New York Times. The paper it needs to be on is the Hindu Times in India. The vast majority of the people who are, live in open, uh, who practice open defecation live in India. You talk about water wars as a transboundary issue. The violence in a country like India around water resources and water resource allocation is an intra-country problem. I think you need to focus your attention on where the problems are really difficult. Cholera now, post-earthquake in Nepal, is emerging again. Why? Because the government, including with support from the international donor community, has not pre-positioned, despite the earthquake being foretold for a long period of time, drinking water resources and sanitation resources. There are areas in the Terai, uh, in southern Nepal, adjacent to northern India, with the last census in 2012 showed that over 70% of the people practiced open defecation. You have large intra-communal uh, problems around water supply, around ex-landlords uh, who are absent from the communities, not allowing communities to build toilets not allowing them to have access to water resources. I'm afraid some of the issues you've been discussing are really not addressing the issue. What is India doing to address the problem of culturally accepted open defecation and poor access to water within the state? Thank you. And uh, just the issue about China is a diversion from the, by the government to direct attention 
away from its failure to address its internal problems, and it's easier to blame China than it is to address the issues within the country. Thank you. I don't know. Thank you for your contribution. I, I certainly, my only bit, and I'm going to ask Bob to come in on it, um, is that I read the Hindustan Times every day, and uh, their coverage of water issues is excellent. Mm -hmm. So I can speak for uh, for the for the media part, but perhaps if you can um, uh, help me with the response here. Well, uh, I, again, um, it, it could the, it could be done to, as you said from an absent landlord all the way to, um, to, to a regional government, from a local government to a national government. The, 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 the problems with that policy um, and the way it's implemented is so much, it's down to people. And what we have to do is make sure that the individual from the top to the bottom actually values this. And with a country as large as India, that's, that's a huge challenge to actually make this happen. But that's the call, you're right, if we can get down to the individual, no matter where we are, and the individuals come on board with this, and then we can actually see um, an opportunity for change. Um, but it's uh, India, China is starting to wake up now to the environmental issues that they're having. Um, many places around the world are recognizing this. And, and again, I suppose my interest with the integration, integrated water resource management, is to try to actually get all those things connected together in a way that we didn't, we, we sort of missed 20 or 30 years ago. And I, and I think there, there's definitely, I, I would agree, a need to connect all those things together. And, and it, it, it does touch transnational issues. What do you, what's your thoughts, Ro Ruby? Well, it does, but I mean, I, I agree with, with everything you're saying. Um, and I mean, international law itself and international law on water particularly isn't really about the interstate issues. So it's not set up to address those issues. Um, particularly international water law is, an, is a really a state-to-state -state regime, which is different to something like the biodiversity regime, which has a much stronger uh, focus on protecting the, the, the interstate issue and protecting local communities. Um, and, and I don't know Indian water law, so I don't know the national laws of India about, about water and sanitation, so I can't comment on that. Um, and I, I, I think it is often true that, that countries tend to focus, when they are a transboundary, um, country with a transboundary water source, they do tend to look at blaming the neighbour as a cause for all of the problems that they have in their own country. That's not only in India. I mean, ma many countries do that. Um, and, but that isn't an issue that international water law can address. That's a political issue in the country. So, I mean, yeah. Um, other questions from the floor? Sir. Uh, my name is Salman Salman. I'm a fellow with the International Water Resource Association. You are Dr. Salman Salman. Um, uh, and please uh, introduce yourself. Yeah, I did. <laughs> uh, and I'm here by the invitation of the Slides College, uh, Slides uh, University Law School. Uh, and we just want to follow up on the point made by Sheila and the uh, comment made by Ruby about India, China, and the real spirit. I was really uh, amazed by the report that India Premier urged to take up issues of Chinese dams on the Brahmaputra. Because if you look a little bit we look at uh, issues from the other angle, Bangladesh has been complaining bitterly mm -hmm. about what India is doing in the Ganges, the planning transfer of the rivers to the south, the work on the Ganges, flooding Bangladesh during the rainy season and keeping the water during the dry season. And uh, so they are complaining about what China is doing, which they are doing for Bangladesh. And I think this issue just raises the, the cardinal, cardinal and a very basic issue that there is a need for cooperation. Those three countries or four countries of the Brahmaputra and the Ganges sit down together. There are a lot of synergies that can be can be drawn from the from cooperation on the Brahmaputra and the Ganges. But uh, on the issue of the water law in India, uh, and uh, reply to Sheila, the central government will tell you, of course, in a sarcastic way. This is, those are local issues, those are domestic issues. In water law and water responsibility for water is a, is a state responsibility. It's not for the central government. And that's a way of diverting from the main issue because there are responsibilities for the central government under the constitution of the basic rights. There are responsibilities for the Indian government on, on, on many other issues that will uh, entail action and will require action on, on water issues. Thank you. 
But uh, Dr. Salman, I, I, I'd appreciate your view on the thing that I keep on bringing up, which is we need to get water onto the front page of the New York Times. Why, why are we, the water family, the water community here, we have water technologists, we have NGO representation, we have academics, water lawyers and others around the room. We all think water is important, but why isn't um, society acknowledging um, water as a global strategic resource and a, 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 a threat, um, a, a, a danger to us as a species? I think there is recognition, and then there is a growing recognition. Yeah. And Gabriel Stein over there can, uh, can comment more on this, because we were talking about bringing international water law to the universities in, in the United States. There are very few universities and colleges that really deal with water law, whether on, on uh, national level or international level. And the reason I get it from Gabriel, from Cindy McCarthy, from many other colleagues who work on this area is that it's not an issue in the, for the states. Colleges do not get students who are interested in international water law. I went to Yale Law School where I studied, and I thought my lecture will draw 200, 300 students. There were 20, and some of them were yawning. It's not an area that Yale Law School is interested in because. Yeah, but that's law. That's law. <laughs> I think. I think. I think there are. It's not just the New York Times and the TV. I think it's a, a, a larger issue. I mean, uh, that there are no problems in the United States, largely except in the South. So why fix it if it's not broken? No, no, well, I, 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 I'm conscious of our time here, and um, would like. Uh, John Oldfield's um, view. Uh, you, you've been uh, kind, kind enough to get up early and, and, and join us uh, from Washington, D.C., John. Uh, how are we going to get water onto the front page? Well, boy, and I, I'd like to answer that question by returning to the previous uh, questioner's comment. Which front page? I like that question a lot, and I'm going to lose sleep over that. Um, our targets should not simply be the donor countries. If you look at, a, at an IMF report from, it's probably 10 years old now, uh, the Chem de Sue report is what it's called. Uh, give or take, these are global averages, but 70% of the uh, financial decisions, 70% of the money for water and sanitation comes not from the international donor community, not from the private sector, but from public sector finance in developing countries. So if we need, if we actually want to focus on development, not on development assistance, if we actually want to focus on solving the world's water and sanitation challenge, our focus needs to be uh, on uh, media throughout Africa, Asia, and Latin America, and to a lesser extent uh, in, in, in the donor countries. Um, I think the best way to do that is uh, to, um, it, it's, water is a difficult thing to pitch to the media uh, because it can be so many different things to so many different people. So I, I think we're asking for, you know, a, a, a global poverty project uh, does grassroots activism. Uh, the One Campaign does grassroots activism. End Water Poverty does grassroots activism for water and for sanitation across the globe. I'd suggest that those activists need to be trained on media outreach, not to focus, not to encourage journalists and their editors to focus on the gravity of the problem, but to focus on what's being done uh, in, in their respective countries and what those people would like their governments to do uh, to complement what, uh, what those communities are already doing. If I might take uh, 30 seconds and quickly address the India question as well, uh, India is 60% of the world's remaining open defecation problem. There are 600 million people in India who defecate in the open on a daily basis. There were about a million globally. What's India doing to address that problem? Well, they've sure tried a lot of things in the past that have uh, not been successful for any number of reasons, but uh, kudos to uh, their relatively new Prime Minister Narendra Modi, whose launch who has launched uh, his Swachh Bharat Abhiyan, his Clean India campaign. His dream, his vision is to give Mahatma Gandhi his 150th birthday present on October 2nd, 2019 of a clean India, of a zero open defecation India, of a 100% coverage of, of sanitation uh, throughout the country. 
Um, I think it's in the world's best interest to do what we can to make sure that Prime Minister Modi wins that bet, that he wins that gamble, which is an enormous one. Uh, the third quick thing I'd add is, is our own uh, relatively small effort at WASH Advocates. We get that we can't solve this problem from the United States or from the North. Therefore, uh, we have found ways to strengthen the capacity of our sister organizations in Africa, Asia, and Latin America. We've made uh, 14 relatively small subgrants from our group to our sister organizations in those countries only for advocacy, only for safe drinking water and sanitation advocacy in those countries. And I think those 14 people may well be a, a part of the answer to how to raise awareness of this, issues, uh, of this issue within their own countries. Thank you very much, John. Uh, we're getting tight on time. Um, I, I, I can probably do one more quick question from, uh, from the audience. Yes, ma'am. No, we're done. Time is up, um, guys, it's the final whistle. Uh, thank you very much for being with us. Um, uh, our thanks as USCA News are due to um, the University of Strathclyde for being our hosts, uh, to our supporters um, at the Scottish Government, Highlands and Islands Enterprise and Scottish Enterprise. Many, many thanks to um, our panel here and we hope that the USCA News viewership will stay tuned for the uh, afternoon uh, local time element of um, today's proceedings at the University of Strathclyde um, uh, featuring uh, my friend uh, Gabriel Eckstein and uh, we'll catch up again soon. Thank you very much. Thank you.